Hello, Silvio Burcescu here from Mensama Center with another Need to Know Basis video. We will discuss three emerging drugs, salvia, spice, bath salts, and four exotics, CAT, GHB, ayahuasca, and ibogaine. Let's start with salvia. Salvia is a plant from South America. The active component of this plant is salvinorin A. Salvia is administered by chewing the leaves, drinking the juice of the leaves, or drying the leaves and smoking them as cigarettes, or maybe using them in a water pipe or a vaporizer. What is a water pipe, you might ask, and I think very few of you might ask, since uh, it's almost an iconic presence in uh, movies from Middle East. Well, it's a recipient of, uh, of glass in which usually tobacco is burnt. The novelty is that the smoke, instead of being directly inhaled into the lungs, it's percolated through water, which humidifies it and makes it less irritant. Very often in this water there are uh, flavors that uh, change the taste and the smell of the smoke. And obviously it can be used for salvia, uh, for salvia as well. What is uh, a vaporizer? Well, vaporizer is something that many of you might not know of. That's a device usually um, used for marijuana. It's a um, heater that heats the plant to a temperature that is less than one needed to make it burn, therefore uh, evaporating the active components of the plant or of the herb and uh, making its use a little less dangerous. Well, whether this is the case or not is, uh, is still not decided. Nobody made any studies to prove that using a vaporizer is healthier than the smoke, but it's kind of universally accepted that it's probably less dangerous to use a vaporizer than just to uh, burn the, the herb, marijuana or salvia, and actually smoke it. What is the active ingredient? Salvinorin A. Salvinorin A uh, acts on uh, a type of uh, opioid receptors called the kappa receptors. The main opioid receptors are delta, kappa, and mu. Heroin and morphine, for example, act mostly on the mu receptors. Salvinorin A acts on kappa receptors. The effect takes one minute to set in and lasts for 30 minutes and causes changes in visual perception, in body perception, in the perception of reality, and some emotional changes. The effect is probably closest to hallucinogenic group of illicit substances. Uh, think about that, a herb that is called Salvia divinorum suggested from the get-go that some people somewhere on the planet use this plant to cause themselves some altered states of mind, often identified as religious experiences. From this point of view, it is no different than psilocybin or mescaline or other psychedelic drugs. Some people are of opinion that these substances help the individual access a different level of consciousness, making the user understand much more about the world than before. The only thing that is very likely to happen is to teach the user of the relativity of our sensorial experiences. There is this view that the psychedelics make you see an alternative reality that is unreachable by mere mortals. Of course, it does that. It does, though, by fabricating a new reality. We have the reality which is caused by physical phenomena acting upon our senses, and then the fabricated reality caused by substances that disrupt the normal functioning of the brain. What is the use of this alternate reality? Zero. Nothing. You cannot take decisions based on this imaginary reality. It is not a functional reality. The only thing that is, uh, this experience teaches us is that reality is a subjective construct, is a re reflection of something that is happening out there that cannot be known in an absolute way, by, but just through interpretations that our brain assigns to it. As long as our brain functions properly, this construct is sound and helpful. If we disrupt the neurons with all sorts of mind-altering drugs, what we get is a distortion, an anomaly that has very little, if any, value. It can be intriguing, seductive, inducing many to believe in its validity, but there is no value or no validity to it. So we talked about salvia, now we are going to talk about spice. Spice is sold under the name of K2, Yucatan fire, moon rocks, fake weed. And, surprise, this thing was sold in gas stations and through the internet. The manufacturer claims it is a mixture of herbs with psychoactive properties, but the reality is that the mixture would have no psychoactive properties 
if it wasn't for the synthetic cannabinoids which impregnate these otherwise useless herbs. So let me make sure that you understand this right. <clears throat> some wise guy took some weeds, not marijuana though, from the back of his house or from who knows what ditch at the edge of his street, dried them, chopped them, and packaged them. But before packaging them, soak them in la pièce de résistance, some synthetic cannabinoids, and uh, changed this um, worthless bag of dried leaves into a hit product. But why synthetic cannabinoids and uh, not just mix some marijuana or hashish in it? Well, it's very simple to squeeze through some legal loopholes because these synthetic molecules were not on the official list of controlled substances initially. Of course, many states caught on and added them promptly so the legal machinery could start chewing on this issue, prosecuting its peddlers. So there's nothing more to say about spice except for they're just marijuana in disguise. Bath salts. Now this is an interesting twist. I would like to meet the marketing strategist on, uh, on this. Why bath salts? What is the appeal of this name? How does that name compare with uh, Black Pearl, which is heroin, or Satan's Secret, Inhalants, or Black Star, LSD? Well, so what is under this unappealing name, bath salts? An equally unappealing chemical name, 3,4-methylene-dioxypyrovalerone, or MDPV. This substance causes reuptake inhibition of norepinephrine and dopamine, but this does not say much because there are many legitimate substances, legitimate psychiatric medications that do the same thing and have no addictive potential and their health risks are very small. When it comes to bath salts, the research is remarkably scarce. We know that this substance is addictive since it leads to consumption patterns typical for addiction, but uh, there are no systematic studies done in humans. The only studies so far have been done on laboratory rats. How on earth are rats going to tell us if a substance is addictive? Well, that is very simple. Self-administration. If a rat self-administers a substance, that means it is addictive. You might think right away, hey, wait a minute, rats eat everything inside. They chew even on electric wire, for God's sake. You're not saying that electric wires are addictive. Well, very well observed, but uh, what if you put a substance like bath salts into an intravenous solution that goes straight into the rat's bloodstream and the rat has control over its administration by pressing a lever? Then you have a model that can yield useful information. There is no longer an issue of taste since the substance goes straight into the bloodstream, if the rat decides to press the lever repeatedly and self-administer a substance, that means that there must be something enjoyable about that substance, about the effect of that substance. It's pretty smart, but um, that is a very sure thing. If the rat presses the lever like crazy to cause the substance to seep into his bloodstream, that means the substance has an addictive potential. Very straightforward. So we know that methylene dioxypyrovalerone is addictive and we also know that it can cause agitation, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, panic or intense anxiety, even psychotic experiences. Now you might ask what's so great about being anxious or having palpitations? No, well, not much, but this is not the end of the story. In addition to those effects, users also report a euphoric feeling, increased alertness, increased feelings of empathy, increased awareness of sensations of all kinds. In other words, it makes users experience those perceptions that usually melt into the background of alertness in a more intense, more lively manner. Chemically, it is an alkaloid related to 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine or NMDMA or ecstasy. It is also related to methamphetamine or catinone. Catinone being the active ingredient in cat, the preferred, uh, the preferred drug of Somali pirates. <clears throat> but let's review. We talked about salvia, which with its active component salvinorin A, we, uh, which is a hallucinogen. About spice, which is an active, um, uh, which is uh, uh, as active ingredient contains cannabinoids, pretty much similar to marijuana, and then the bath salts whose active component is MDPV, a stimulant close to, in the structure, to ecstasy. If we started speaking about pirates and cat, let's look into exotic drugs. In his book, Pirates of Somalia, the journalist J. 
Bahadur describes Kant as a sine qua non condition for employment. A useful little piece of information if you ever run into a situation where you need to hire some pirates. Any pirate captain know, knows that his crew would not sign up for the job unless he assures a constant stream of this plant called Kat. This plant comes out of Arabian Peninsula. Or to be more, more exact, it doesn't come out of Arabian Peninsula because uh, its use is pretty much limited to Ethiopia, Yemen and Somalia. Usually the only traces of wealth in the coastal region of Somalia after this big piracy wave are the occasional brand new Toyota pickup trucks since the other proceeds of this hazardous occupation are chewed up in the form of cut. Cut's active ingredient, as I mentioned, is catinone, which is a stimulant. It inhibits the reuptake of norepinephrine and epinephrine, as well as directly stimulating the serotonin receptors. Its effect lasts around three hours and are described as similar with those of cocaine and amphetamines. While intoxicated, users are more talkative than usual, pupils are dilated, they become hyperactive, euphoric. Cat is chewed or brewed in a tea form. Another fine example of exotics is GHB, gamma hydroxybutyrate. In 1990s, believe it or not, it was even sold in health food stores until the FDA took notice that um, it has intoxicating effects, it can cause somnolence and even euphoria since it gets re released dopamine in ventral tegmental area, the same like most of the addictive substances. Nowadays, GHB is seldom seen. In my clinical practice in over two decades, I ran into only one patient addicted to this substance. As opposed to catinone, which is naturally occurring compound, GHB is an entirely synthetic drug, non-existent in nature. It is synthesized rather easily in the home labs Therefore, its production is much more difficult to track down and shut down. It is odorless, tasteless, easily soluble, and can induce a post-intoxication amnesia. These characteristics made it the preferred drug for sexual predators to use on their victims, and it is the original date-rape drug. But still, the most wide, widely used uh, date-rape drug remains, guess which one? good old alcohol. As if alcohol did not have enough of a bad reputation. GHB does not lack some therapeutic value. It has been looked at for treatment of alcohol withdrawal and chronic severe insomnia. Sodium oxybate is a close derivative of GHB which is now marketed under the name of Zyrem. Because of its terrible reputation though, Zyrem is an extremely difficult to use medication since it's very strictly controlled by the FDA. The formalities involved in using Zyrem are so prohibitive that it makes it almost as non-existent for most of the patients. Well, let's move on to some other oddities of the drug world. By the way, believe it or not, this is the name of a local pharmacy, Drug World, rather a bold marketing decision I might say. We are going to leave behind the realm of addictive substances <coughs> and talk about psychedelic drugs. These are a, dr a group of substances that are not particularly enjoyable, or you might say you need to develop a acquired taste for them. In general, psychedelics are not addictive, but they are considered equally harmful as the addictive ones. Their use is controlled and punished in the same way as the use of addictive substances. Let's take, for example, harmaline or harmaline. That's an interesting name. A substance that has harm in its name cannot be good. Harmaline has a rather colorful history, starting in the depths of the Amazon jungle. The shamans boiled the bark of a tree called Banisteriopsis inebriens and Banisteriopsis capi into a concoction called ayahuasca, the vine spirit in Quechuan language. They believe that it can give people supernatural abilities to find out enemy war plans, identify the sorcerer responsible for the illness of a relative or other wild ideas. What harmaline from this tree bark does in reality is causing a very strange and complex emotional perceptual disturbance, 
What is observable is definitely the very unflattering mixture of vomiting, shouting, prancing around in a disorganized manner for 2-3 hours, and some natives would do this for days by taking more and more of this plant to maintain its effects all through this time. What is reported is the experience of flying, or dying, or seeing events one believes are happening at the far distance, seeing peoples, animals, gods, devils, and all sorts of other hallucinations. Myself, I could never understand the fascination with these experiences. It is no different than sticking your feet in oversized uh, clown show shoes and running around stumbling, falling, and believing it is an enjoyable experience. And the idea that these malfunctions of the brain offer a glimpse into a so-called quote-unquote dimension forbidden to mere mortals is just absurd. I'm sure I'm going to get some harsh comments, uh, usually based on the idea, why do you talk about things that uh, you did not experience? And yes, I must admit, I do not use uh, this tree bark, but I know a lot about how the mind functions, and to me, handicapping neurons is not my idea of fun, and definitely not the right way to learn anything. When you start actually making a nice story based on misfiring of neurons, you may as well start believing in Santa or Easter Bunny again. It is fully understandable why Quechua people called this concoction ayahuasca the spirit vine, but gushing over this uh, effect of harmaline is rather absurd in the 21st century. If we are speaking about uh, gushing over questionable quote-unquote miracles, let's go to Ibogaine. This is another star among uh, psychedelics. It is uh, the active substance of Tamanta iboga, a plant which, uh, in similar man manner with Banisteriopsis inebriens vine, it was used by tribes across the Atlantic in Africa this time. And the same as the Amazonians, the Africans used it in the proto-religious practices. The Europeans became aware of this plant in late 1900s and 1930s. Um, it was even brought from Gabon to France and commercialized under the name of Lambarine. I do not understand what was the use of such uh, substance when it was put on the market at that time, but the interest in, uh, in this plant in Europe was pretty much zero. But in 1960s, rumors sounded about the effects of this substance in diminishing or stopping the use of addictive substances, including alcohol. Up to date, there is no evidence to clearly assess that this substance is doing more than cause temporary psychotic symptoms similar to other hallucinogens. Despite reports of death caused by ibogaine, there are still quote-unquote centers that use ibogaine for treatment of addiction. Usually these quote-unquote centers are in Latin America, possibly even in Europe, but no reliable treatment facility or clinician would touch this plant for more than research purposes. Well, this is pretty much uh, what I had to say about this uh, topic. Do not forget, we talked about the emerging drugs, salvia with salvinorin A, the um, bath salts with MDPV as an active principle, the spice, uh, which, ha which are just uh, uh, marijuana in disguise, and uh, then we talked about uh, some uh, exotic drugs, GHB, CART, uh, ibogaine and ayahuasca. Well, so subscribe to this channel if you want more updates on psychiatric issues of any kind.